So, Star Wars Issue 108 has finally been released. This is the moment we've all been waiting for. A lot of us fans were nervous about how the first Legends comic in nearly five years would go. But now that it's out, what's it like? Well, I have to say, it's actually pretty good. And I'm not just saying that because it's part of the Legends universe, either. If it was bad or lazily tied into the new canon, I would let you all know. I went into the comic shop expecting a decent enough story, but it exceeded my expectations by quite a bit, and I ended up walking out with 10 copies. I would recommend this comic to anybody who's a fan of Star Wars, new and old, because as a one-shot, it's a largely self-contained story, and simple enough to understand. It provides introductions to less familiar characters for more casual fans. However, to fully enjoy and appreciate what this comic is, and what it represents, I strongly encourage people who are interested in this comic to first read the original Marvel Star Wars comic run. What issue 108 is, first and foremost, is a love letter to fans of the original Marvel comics. The story is simple enough to enjoy on its own merit, but there are many nods and callbacks to characters and events from the original Marvel Star Wars that being familiar with those stories really gives you a better understanding and appreciation. The cheapest and fastest way you can read them all is by getting the Dark Horse Omnibuses a long time ago, volumes 1 through 5. I'll put an Amazon link in the description for all of them. That said, this comic can get very zany, and intentionally so. To different people, that can be either a good thing or a bad thing. The original Marvel Star Wars was well known for its more out-there adventures, and issue 108 follows in that vein, as I would expect it to. And even if you don't want this comic, I'd still recommend supporting it. The number one thing you can do if you want Legends to come back is to show that it sells well. Disney, Lucasfilm, and Marvel are throwing a bone to us with this one. As upset as I'm sure we've all been with their treatment of the EU these past five years, now is our chance to prove ourselves. If we show them that this comic sells, we'll be more likely to see other stories in our continuity in the future. Now, from here on out, there are going to be spoilers. So if you want to read it first, stop by your local comic book store and pick it up, or purchase it off Marvel.com digitally. I'll include a link in the description for that one too. I encourage you to pause the video, go read the comic, and come back here to hear my thoughts on it. It's $5.99, which is slightly more than a lot of single comic issues are these days, but it feels twice as long too, so it's very much worth the price. So let's start off with the covers. And they all look pretty great, honestly. Though the main cover, as well as many of the variants, feature Darth Vader very prominently. Technically, Vader's in the story, but just within a small flashback at the beginning. So maybe it's not the most accurate cover they could have used. But what can you say? Everybody knows Darth Vader. Vader sells, so you put him on covers. Walter Simonson, who got to draw the cover, even put a tribute on it for one of the original Marvel Star Wars writers, Archie Goodwin. So that was real nice. I think my favorite of the covers is the one with the main cast in the middle of a bar shootout. There's so much detail in it, and it most accurately depicts a scene from the story itself. So... Issue 108, or Forever Crimson, has eight chapters, all written by Matthew Rosenberg, but illustrated by many different artists for each chapter. The different styles might throw you off a little bit, but the tone stays consistent throughout, and the styles aren't that radically different. They all resemble the old Star Wars style, and you can even see the Binday dots in the background of many panels, just like you would see on an older comic. The artists for 108 have all used them to make the comic feel like a classic comic book from the 80s. Though it doesn't perfectly mimic the classic style, I think it blends it in with how a lot of modern comics are drawn today. That's the best way I can describe it anyway. I also think the way the story is structured, how the dialogue is more expository, and just the general feel of the plot all feel like you're reading an original Marvel Star Wars comic. Matthew Rosenberg clearly did his research. Anyway, Chapter 1, The Legend of Valance the Hunter, which was shown off in the preview, opens up with a retelling of Valance the Hunter's story as it is told in the original Marvel comics. He was a feared cyborg bounty hunter who despised droids because they reminded him of himself. But when he saw C-3PO prepare to sacrifice himself for Luke, Valence is moved by their compassion for each other and even defended them from Darth Vader at the cost to his own life. Vader and Valence fought, but Valence is dropped into a pool of acid called Ruby Flame Lake. We then cut to the present, which I would estimate it as a little while after issue 107, where a group of scavengers are at Ruby Flame Lake looking for scrap, but they also pick up Valence's corpse by chance. When I read this in the preview, I was really excited, but I was super nervous too, because one of my first thoughts was, 
Is this just going to be a bunch of new canon characters discussing legends from the old continuity as if they were just stories that never actually happened? I'm very thankful that wasn't the case. In Chapter 2, Near Misses and Nero escapes, Han and Chewbacca are in a bar being hired by an alien named Slider, who is transporting a little plant to his boss. Unfortunately, the scum and villainy in the bar decide to go for the bounties on the three of them, and Slider gets killed in the ensuing escape. Once Han and Chewie get outside, they bump into their former colleagues in a few issues from the original Marvel comics, Jackson the Rabbit and Amazia Foxtrain. Jackson reveals that they were trying to collect a bounty on Slider, who was actually working for Dominant Hag, an ex-imperial that once tried to spread a disease called the Crimson Forever, and then the four of them escape together. In the short Chapter 3, A Scavenger's Mistake, the scavengers from Chapter 1 are delivering the Durasteel they collected at Ruby Form Lake to people who appear to be part of the New Republic. They even have a New Republic ship. They take the scrap along with Balance's corpse, but it's revealed that they are working for someone else, and we are left with the implication that the group of scavengers are killed off, so that there isn't any loose ends to whatever these faux New Republic soldiers are plotting. In Chapter 4, Old Worries in the New Republic, Leia is on the planet Noquivzor discussing how New Republic forces are stretched thin, right before being attacked by a top assassin. Something interesting to note about the planet Noquivzor, if you've read the X-Wing novels, you may recognize this as the planet where Rogue Squadron was based out of before the recapture of Coruscant. The Zeltrons Leia are talking to are all from the original Marvel comics, too. Anyway, Leia subdues the assassin, but then Plip the Hujib lets Leia know that the Millennium Falcon is badly damaged and crashing. But luckily, Luke comes in and stops it with force. The group reconnect and determine that Domina Tag must be up to something. Leia remembers how Domina Tag tried to use ancient jewels to spread the Crimson Forever Plague to get revenge for the death of her brother, and the last that she's heard of Domina was that she was in exile in a region that was having minor labor disputes. C-3PO reveals that Danny and a New Republic peacekeeping force were all sent there to ensure that matters didn't escalate, but they haven't heard anything from them, even though they were due back days ago. In Chapter 5, for fear of what might wake, Domina Tag orders her men by hologram to bring her the Durasteel that they took from the scavengers. Suddenly, Valence's robotic corpse comes to life and massacres the crew of soldiers aboard. It is revealed that Slider was working for Domina Tag, but they've lost contact with him. Domina is frustrated to learn that they can no longer get the Durasteel or the Arachne Bloom for their mission to recover the ancient jewels that Domina once tried to use to spread the Crimson Forever Plague. The Durasteel was going to be used to transport the jewels, and the Bloom was going to be used to counteract the symptoms. Domina decides that they are going to go after the jewels regardless. Meanwhile, Valence killed off all the humans aboard the ship he was on, but spared a droid. We learn that Valence is even less human than we originally thought, with only his brain being the only organic thing left in his Terminator-like body. The droid named FRD-80K tells Valence that the jewels thereafter can spread the plague when separated, but can restore life when brought together. In Chapter 6, On the Way to Forever, the good guys travel to the derelict Star Destroyer where they left the jewels years ago to make sure they're still safe. The empty Star Destroyer is also slowly drifting towards the sun. Then Domina Tag's ship shows up and starts shooting at them. In Chapter 7, Snatched Away from the Sun, Han waits until they're out of sight, and then shoots an escape pod into a hole of the Star Destroyer with Luke, Leia, R2, and Jackson inside. All are wearing protective suits to keep them safe from the Crimson Forever Plague. They only have a short time to look around before Domina sends out a scout ship to go after them. Suddenly, the bridge they go over gets destroyed by a thermal detonator. Leia's suit got ripped in the explosion, and the Crimson Forever Plague is already making her sick. Then Jackson finds both the jewels, but they're all cornered by Domina and a pack of bounty hunters. They head back to the destroyed bridge, and Jackson jumps over the gap, initially seeming like he's going to help the rest of them get across, but he decides to betray them so he can escape with the jewels and sell them for a lot of money. This is probably my least favorite part of the comic, because while I wasn't a huge fan of Jackson before, this makes him quite unlikable, and he doesn't even redeem himself later on. It'd be like if in A New Hope, Han didn't come back at the end and help Luke blow up the Death Star. I'm not too upset by this, because again, I'm not a huge fan of Jackson, and it's not like he was ever a super heroic character to begin with. Anyway, Leia, Luke, and R2 make their own way back to the hangar, but Han alerts them that they have even more company. In Chapter 8, The End of the Hunt, Valence crashes the New Republic ship into the hangar and chases off Domina's bounty hunters. Jackson tries and fails to get the drop on him. 
Him and Luke reconnect, and Jackson gives him the jewels that he tried to steal. They take their effect on Valence, and his real human body seems to grow back over his metal one. Unfortunately, Domina shoots him, and then she shoots Luke, exposing him to the Crimson forever. And then she tosses one of the jewels into space, sealing both Luke's and Leia's fate. FRD shows Valence the same compassion that Valence showed him when sparing him, and sacrifices his power core to restart Valence's battery. Right before Domina stabs Leia, Valence stops her and takes the remaining jewel. Valence jumps out of the ship and is able to bring both jewels together, but at the cost of his own life. The gravity will pull him and the jewels into the sun, but by bringing the jewels together, he saves Luke, Leia, and the rest of the galaxy from the Crimson Forever Plague for good. He dies, but he dies as a fully restored human. Like I said, this is a fantastic comic. It's the story I never knew that I wanted, and its publication might make people want to go back and read the original Marvel comics. At least I hope it does. I'm a fan of the old Marvel comics, and I still see some EU fans say this comic isn't a victory, because it doesn't adhere to the EU from the 90s, kicked off with Tim Zahn's Heir to the Empire, and the Dark Horse comics. The old Marvel was considered S-canon, or secondary canon. That's true enough, but so many elements of the comics get interwoven with the rest of the EU, where a certain character plays a huge role later, or a place, or a planet, or a species gets referenced somewhere else down the line. Let me be clear. If you are an EU completionist, or you are someone who wants more legend stories added to the timeline, it is a mistake to write these comics off, especially issue 108, because its success would lead to more legend stories in the future. Ones that you really do want to see, like Sword of the Jedi, War Force Unleashed 3, or whatever else. And in addition to my list of future stories I want to see added to the EU, I want Matthew Rosenberg to make issue 109. He's proven his love for Star Wars and the EU here, and I am seeing potential for more stories to follow 108. Leia talking about Nagai and Mandalorians fighting against the top resistance was enough to get me excited. They mentioned how Danny a character from the old Marvel comics, went missing, presumably killed by Domina's men. But I hope not. I hope she survived somehow and wasn't killed off panel. I want to see her come back for a future issue. Heck, Lamaya could even come back and cause more trouble. Maybe they could make more sea cannon references in issue 109, and chip away at the myth that the Marvel comics don't matter to the EU. If you want more creative freedom in Star Wars that doesn't have to connect with the new canon, and you want to take it a slightly wackier direction? The original Marvel Star Wars is your outlet. Yes, it's true. The EU could get weird at times. That unexpectedness, that embrace of the wild side, is what made it fun. That's why I'm so glad the EU isn't just a retread of the original trilogy. Trying to constrain yourself to the movies, and only the movies, forever and ever, gives you bland, predictable plots, and Rebels vs. Empire again and again and again. But at the same time, the EU still feels like I'm in the Star Wars universe. That creativity and that Star Wars feel is present in issue 108, and I couldn't be happier with how it turned out. Once again, I'm just happy that the people who always said, it will never happen, just give up, have been proven wrong. This comic is everything the EU movement has been campaigning for. Thank you, Lucasfilm. Thank you, Marvel. Thank you, Story Group. And thank you, Matthew Rosenberg, for making this comic possible. I really hope to see more legend stories in the near future.